join us if they can. Um, we have today with us uh, Dr. Dennis Martin, and he's going to be talking to us about um, understanding the practical use of buffalo grass as a lawn in Oklahoma, which always comes up. We don't we talk about buffalo grass, I believe, in train in our training, but don't necessarily go into a lot of detail in it. So this is an opportunity for us to get the nitty gritty from Dr. Martin on buffalo grass. Next week, um, the same time, we will be having a presentation oh. by Jen Olson, who will be addressing um, managing, uh, diagnosing diseases in the landscape and using practical management to take care of those problems. So hope you can join us for that one too. Um, we will go ahead and wait till the end of Dennis's presentation to ask, to address questions. So if you will hold your questions until then, um, you're welcome to drop them in the chat box uh, in the meantime, and then we'll address them at the end. Um, also, if you're just joining us, if you could, if you haven't already in the, in the chat box, if you could indicate which county you're representing, um, that will be helpful for me as, as well for um, recording purposes. So, okay, Dennis, I'm going to turn the time over to you and, uh, and, we'll, and, and whenever you're done, we'll address some of the questions. Great. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I'm excited to visit with you about buffalo grass as a lawn in Oklahoma. We do get a fair number of questions concerning buffalo grass every year, but we don't spend a lot of time of, of, with it in our normal discussions. So we're going to focus for the next 40 minutes on buffalo grass. There's my contact information. I'm a professor in turf vegetation management specialist at Oklahoma State University. I won't share my video today. I look largely like the top image, but I do clean up to look like the bottom image uh, most of the time. So there's my contact information. If you have questions, uh, even after the presentation, you can feel free to email me. And uh, although I'm seldom in the office, that phone number displayed there does forward to my cell phone. Uh, give me some time when you do call and leave a message, because I'm oftentimes in the field uh, in the mud or the dust and not uh, on the cell phone itself. So uh, buffalo grass, warm season perennial grass. And I wanted to show you an image of my lawn. I've worked with it in my lawn for about 14 years now. And this is my front sidewalk. And to the front of the image is a higher fertility view, more irrigation water into the back, less nitrogen fertility and no irrigation. So it's, it does respond to watering and it does respond to fertility inputs. Sometimes you'll see that it, in the literature, someone will incorrectly state that it doesn't respond to fertilizer. And that just simply isn't true. A good portion of this presentation is set up to dispel some of the common myths and alleged magic surrounding uh, buffalo grass. So there's a view to the right again, higher fertility and also higher irrigation inputs and to the left, lower fertility and no irrigation. And so it will go brown during a drought like uh, any other turf grass. And in fact, as you go into a drought, buffalo grass is notorious for firing its leaves. That means it, uh, they wilt, they turn tan in bright sunlight and they go brown. But that doesn't mean the crown or growing point or the root system is dying. It's a means of saving water during an anticipated drought. So oftentimes buffalo grass will fire its leaves and turn tan well before Bermuda grass does during droughty soil conditions. Buffalo grass being a warm season grass, its leaves frost off in the winter. And so it turns a bright and I think a beautiful tan during the winter months. It will have winter annual weed invasion as well, just like Bermuda grass. So it will uh, turn green from whatever grows in it in the way of cool season annuals, in the way of grasses and broad leaves during the winter months. So it goes brown in the winter, just like Bermuda grass and other warm season turf grasses. There's a close up of buffalo grass in the winter. I will ask everyone to mute their microphone during the presentation. Um, so this is buffalo grass, very fine textured, soft appearance, and it is brown during the winter. And if we uh, put our hand on it and brush it back, we can see the live green stems at the basis of the plant during the winter time. So it is alive, it's just had its canopy frosted off and damaged by freeze injury of the leaves, but the crowns down here are quite alive. You can mix buffalo grass, a native perennial, with other native annual or native perennial grasses. 
Uh, here's an example of a mixture of buffalo grass with blue grama and side oats grama in summer in a non-mode condition. There is the seed head of side oats grama and this is blue grama here. So you can form a three species or use seven species native short grass prairie mix if you wish. Okay, so I took this for golf course architects. There's a golf ball sitting in a, a recently plugged stand of a seeded buffalo grass that uh, we grew the seed of in plug flat trays, planted it out and it grew. And this is non-mode and that grass there is about 10 inches tall. And I took that for an architect because the architect was going to spec that in an un unmowed rough. And he asked, can you lose a golf ball in it? And I said, sure. And it's quite easy if you leave it unmowed. So um, my lawn, I regularly have snakes that are entirely hidden, four and five foot long western rat snakes that are two inches in diameter and they can hide down in the grass. So I love that. You may not love that. All right. There's a shorter view of buffalo grass there unmowed that's where it's about five inches tall but I caution you under high fertility and irrigation or a wet year it can get to eight ten inches in height so don't think that it's only an inch or so tall some folks from Woodward once said that can't be buffalo grass it never gets over an inch tall well if you've got cattle grazing it and it's in a drought out at Woodward sure uh, it'll only get to an inch but under fertility um, and irrigation or high rainfall you will uh, have a taller canopy. Now we experienced some of the worst droughts in recorded modern history back in the 11-12 time period if you'll recall. Uh, beyond this gravel drive to the left I've got Wrangler Bermuda grass, it's a common seeded Bermuda grass, and then I've got Texoka and Cody off to the the right hand side and this is during the drought July of 2012 and so you can see the buffalo grass completely fired off over in this area to the right and the the uh, Wrangler was still green during that droughty period right then. So that's not at all uncommon. What's unique about buffalo grass is it has separate male and female plants. And if you recall your botany terms, that means it's dioecious. Di meaning two households, dioecious, two households. And it's kind of interesting because buffalo grass is principally dioecious. That means principally separate male and separate female plants but it's occasionally monoecious. Monoecious meaning one household. So occasionally male and female flowers are born on the same plant. And also what's interesting about buffalo grass is that a plant or a stand of buffalo grass can sometimes be completely female one year and then the next year or two years later, it will flip and express only male flowers. And it is not unusual at all for this to happen out in nature. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, plant. Uh, many of our turf grasses like Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, Bermuda grass, uh, they're monoecious, but this one's principally dioecious, occasionally monoecious. I will caution you native plant people out there that like to leave things tall. Uh, and if you live out at the edge of town, uh, buffalo grass in winter is highly flammable. If you've ever lived through a wildfire, uh, it's like nothing else you've experienced before and it does affect your perspective of how much clear zone you need around your house in order to be able to to battle and protect your house. So I discourage anyone from using highly flammable plant materials up against their house and actually I do encourage having the buffalo grass mowed a little bit lower especially going into the winter months. It is very winter hardy um, so it helps you if you keep a shorter stand so that in case fire comes up there and ignites your dormant turf grass, you, it gives you more time to get the hose out or beat the fire down with a wet broom or something on, on that order. So you want to keep an area clear around your house of flammable plant materials, especially if you live out in the rural interface. So here's a close up after a, a wildfire came through there. And I assure you that the stand does recover. As you see down here in the right hand view, it's adapted to fire. It will kill the stolons at that time, but they, it will shoot out more stolons. It just slows its uh, greening process in the spring if you, if you uh, catch the canopy on fire. If you want to see a native stand of buffalo grass and you're up in the Payne County or, or a Pawnee County area, uh, the little cemetery just north of Pawnee, Oklahoma is one of the best stands of buffalo grass naturally occurring that I know of. Uh, and all they do essentially to this stand is mow it. 
and it's nearly 100% stand in most areas of the cemetery. Although sometimes when they sod uh, recent graves, they have brought in Bermuda grass sod, but it's a wonderful stand of native buffalo grass in the Pawnee Cemetery. Also, if you come visit the uh, proud and immortal bronze at the Student Welcome Center at Oklahoma State University, that is Sundance or buffalo grass sod that was brought in, even though it's a seeded buffalo grass at the, at the uh, Proud and Immortal Bronze Welcome Statue at the Student Union for the Student Welcome Center. Um, that is actually a seeded buffalo, but it was seeded to a sod field and then uh, put in place. Okay, now those of you that are into a little more technical terms, uh, buffalo grass is pretty interesting because we have multiple chromosome levels depending on uh, where you're at in its native range. The farther north you go, the higher number of sets of chromosomes. So a hexaploid, meaning six sets of chromosomes, that's what you're gonna find up in the Dakotas and the Nebraska area. As you get down into Oklahoma, we actually find a mix of diploids, meaning 2X, the tetraploids 4X, and then also the hexaploids, the 6X here. The farther south you go into Texas and Mexico, predominantly you're into the diploids and they're smaller plants. They're smaller plants, lower number of sets of chromosomes, and they're a, a smaller plant. The farther north you go, uh, they're a much larger plant, and they typically are the hexaploids there. Uh, the University of Nebraska is the prominent seeded Bermuda grass and vegetative Bermuda grass development program. And the next goals for them are to, to develop the first of these seeded smaller buffalo grasses with the two sets of chromosomes. If you recall the buffalo grass called prairie buffalo grass, uh, it was a, a female clonal type. It was diploid, just two sets of chromosomes. Things like prestige uh, is a uh, tetraploid 4X and then your seeded types like Sundancer, Cody, Bowie, and then also Texoka, those are hexaploids. Um, there are no examples in the commercial trade of pentaploids, the odd number of sets of chromosomes. Those would be sterile though. Okay, so the seed comes in burrs, not to be fearful of it like a sand burr, but it does look uh, like it does have spines on it, but they're very soft appendages. And there's one to five true seed in each buffalo grass burr. Now I've been working with buffalo grass either directly or indirectly for 36 years this month and I took this shot 36 years ago in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois and that is a Texoka stand mowed at three inches and that's a rich black prairie mollusol soil if that means anything to you. Uh, to the right is non-mowed and that's actually about 10 inches tall Texoka and to the left is a three inch height of cut on Texoka. I took that shot 36 years ago this month and it's found its way into the regular Master Gardener slide set if you've seen it before. Now you know its origin. Okay, some common confusion about buffalo grass. Sometimes it's confused with blue or hairy grandma or with side oats grandma. And that, those are other warm season perennial wonderful native grasses that you find in the short grass prairie. You can integrate them into your lawn, but if you intend to mow that lawn, it will shift principally to buffalo grass and it will shift away from the grandmas. Also, if you've got Bermuda grass as a contaminant, the more you mow it, the more you will favor Bermuda grass in it as well. So throughout the, the conversation today, I want to uh, have you understand that you have to clean up Bermuda grass completely, completely eradicate, eradicate the Bermuda grass before you engage in planting a native grass like uh, buffalo grass or else you're going to have a very uphill battle and eventually you'll have a majority stand of Bermuda grass rather than buffalo grass. Okay, buffalo grass has profuse above ground runners called stolons and the other two species, the grandmas and the side oats grandmas, those principally are a bunch type but buffalo grass is a spreader and so that means that you can take a single plant at it, of it and propagate it through fertilization, irrigation, and mowing, and you can get it to spread by the above ground runners. Here's an example of blue grandma. We find it oftentimes with a sister species, hairy grandma, intermixed with buffalo grass stands out in nature in the short grass prairie. But this is the unique flower head of blue grandma, and it allows you to see what grass species you're working at with. Oftentimes, without the seed head, you wouldn't know the difference in looking at them unless you can find the above ground runners, stolons. 
Here's the seed head of side oats grandma. There's quite a bit of it actually on roadside, but we don't see the seed head uh, on our state and uh, federal managed roadside very often, but it is out there. Here's the native range that buffalo grass was originally found in. So it's principally found east of the taller of the Rocky Mountains, and then it extends to about the Mississippi River. It can extend east of there as long as you don't put it in competition with real tall plants. So this was principally the native range originally, and this is from North American Rangeland Plants, third edition. Okay, on this I show a diagram from Dr. Paul Johnson's publication in Crop Science Journal. The dark area is the principal range of buffalo grass found native, but also can be found through the lighter gray here, and then a projected range of its usefulness is the even lightest grain. So through the mid-continent in what we call the transition zone between warm, humid, and cool, humid, it's projected that you can use buffalo grass in this area and then also throughout the west. As you get up into northern Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, there's really quite a bit of rainfall relative to the evaporation rate and the cool season grasses overpower it oftentimes in that part of the country. Um, the best adapted turf to a site is actually the one that's adapted for the most number of months throughout the year. And as you'll recall, not every day is a drought in Oklahoma. We oftentimes have very wet periods, very overcast periods, and those slow down the growth of buffalo grass when it's overcast. It doesn't like to grow in the shade. It likes full sun. So it's not a solution for shaded areas. And I'm always gonna encourage you to use it only in full sun to very, very lightly shaded areas. Now, if you look at the Native Turf Development Group, they're a commercial private group that develops buffalo grass, seeded types especially. The dark, or excuse me, the green range is that they, where they project their seeded cultivars, such as Bowie, Cody, and Sundancer can be effectively used over. So all of our state is well within the projected range, and I would have to agree with them uh, for the use of their buffalo grasses in that area. Now, for the stuff that you would go out and collect in nature, generally it's true. If you go to Nebraska and collect buffalo grasses, you can take them south and they'll do okay. But if you collect things from Mexico and South Texas and take it north into Kansas and Nebraska, you have increased risk of winter kill. So the provenance or rather the origin of the plant material is important. Now the commercialized cultivars have mixed provenance and they are much widely, more widely adapted usually than what you find growing out in nature. They've had a lot of human intervention in the uh, cultivars that are developed. If you'd like to check where you can purchase sources of buffalo grass seed, sod, or plugs, you can source those out in our current report and you can see it here, it's current report 6609, uh, Buffalo Grass Source Directory. And as always, it's a little bit old, but it's still largely correct. And we do update those every so often. All right, let's look at seeded Buffalo Grasses that are available in the trade. Those include seeded types such as Texoka, Comanche, Bison, Plains, Top Gun, and then also Sharps Improved. Now I like to ask my audience, where do you think the parental types came from that helped in the development of Tex, Oak? Uh, well, the answer is from three states, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. Okay, seeded buffalo grasses that have been improved quite a bit for higher visual quality, meaning darker, greener color, and higher shoot density include the types Cody, Bowie, and Sundancer. And currently, Sundancer is the most advanced seeded line. And also, if you went shopping for it, it would be the one that you would pay the most premium or highest price for. And I'm going to show you the prices on these in just a few minutes. Now, there's trademarked blends, such as Buffalo Pals here, that's sold by Pennington and Seeds West. Buffalo Pals is not an actual cultivated variety name, but rather it's a trademarked name. So Pennington or Seeds West can put essentially any buffalo grass cultivars in that bag and sell it under the branded trademark Buffalo Pals, provided they have permission from the actual proprietary rights holders, whether that would be some of these or some of the public domain 
uh, types, they wouldn't even have to ask for permission there. But when you see the trademark name like this, you have to look at the legal seed trade label to find actually what's in the bag. Buffalo, if you ask me what's in Buffalo Pals, I'd say, I don't know this year. You'll have to check on the legal seed trade label on there. Okay, where can you go for a establishment and management guide for buffalo grass? Well, I would like to say that we have one at Oklahoma State University, but actually Johnston Seed Company has put an excellent one together and their agronomist asked ask me to review it when it was draft form and I did review it and so it, it has my blessing. It has the Oklahoma State University blessing and so that's available at uh, the Johnston Seed Company website and we're in full agreement with the establishment and management practices suggested uh, in that particular document that Johnston Seed has pu uh, published and actually that's from the Native Turf Development Group, the NATURF group. Now what are we looking at cost-wise? Well we're looking at about $20.70 today to almost $22 per pound for per treated pound of buffalo grass seed. So they're going to treat that seed with either potassium nitrate or potassium uh, permanganate. It's going to impart either a blue or purple color. That's going to redu uh, reduce the seed dormancy on it. So when you seed it out, you should get relatively rapid germination. And that process adds several dollars per pound to that seed treatment to reduce the dormancy on it. If you spec'd out non-treated seed, it's true, you would find a lot cheaper seed but it's not going to germinate as quickly and, and sometimes you don't want to wait two and three years for the dormancy to be overcome uh, in a seeded type. Now Texoka is a much older cultivar. Remember 36 years ago I took that photograph at the beginning of this presentation. That was old Texoka. Those improved seeded types did not even exist. Cody, Bowie, Sundancer, um, those didn't even exist back then in the 1980s. We were principally looking at Sharps Improved, Texoka at that time period, and also I believe Comanche. So if you're buying uh, Texoka, you're going to get a break of about $2 per pound for the treated seed. Now after 10 years of using this and putting them under low maintenance, Texoka versus Cody or Bowie, I frankly don't see a lot of difference between Texoka or Bowie and and uh, Texoka or Cody if you put them under low maintenance and that's after viewing them for 10 to 14 years. Sundancer's only been out a few years so we can't really state what it'll look like uh, 10 years from now but I can uh, tell you about Texoka versus the other improved types. Now I took this shot uh, back in the uh, mid uh, 2000s in the first decade there. This is Bowie seeded and it's six weeks after planting, and this is taken in August, and I use two pounds of burrs per thousand square foot and a pound of nitrogen from 10, 20, 10 at seeding, and again at one month after treatment, and I kept it moist every day. And this is a little square block here as a little test, and so that's pretty good. I can take that through winter, but I'm also still gonna get growth into the fall months, although it's gonna great, be uh, greatly um, slowed downs but I did that in the third week of July which would be considered uh, pretty late actually for establishment if you're trying to get a full stand. I'm going to encourage you to go in the month of April or May if you're going to see to make sure you got the whole of the growing season to work with. Now buffalo grass can be sold in the trade as seeded types or as clonal types. Now remember I said it's got stolons you can go out to any buffalo grass stand, take a plant, and if you culture it with fertilizer, irrigation, mowing, you'll be able to get it to spread by its above ground runners or stolons. So that means if you found the perfect plant that had all the characteristics you wanted, you would thereafter not have to gather seed of it. In fact, it wouldn't come true to type from seed anyway. You'd propagate it clonally or vegetatively by breaking off a part and causing that part to grow and produce daughter tillers and daughter stolons. Now I say daughter in the loose sense there because if it's a male plant, it'll still produce stolons or if it's a female plant, it'll produce stolons. It tends though that the female plants are better at forming a denser stand than the male plants. That's just kind of a generalization, not always true, but generally true. Okay, so these are the cultivars that are in the trade where the breeder or developer of them intended for them to be propagated vegetatively. 
and the female lines include 609, Prairie, uh, UC Verity, which isn't very winter hardy here, and Legacy and Prestige. And I have to say that Prestige is my favorite. It's the lowest growing and I consider it one of the more rapidly spreading types. Best adapted and it's got pretty good chinch bug resistance as well. Little Eco is actually a male type offered by Blade Runner Farms in South Texas, but I've not tested it up here. But if you like the male flags or flowers, Eco is one uh, that you could purchase and have shipped up a few hundred miles. That's if you're into the shipping costs. Frontier Turfalo is no longer available. That was from Frontier Hybrids uh, company out um, in uh, West Texas, and they no longer offer that one. Okay, if you want to buy vegetative stock of buffalo grass and you'd like to get Prestige or Legacy, you can order it over the internet from Todd Valley Farms. Now, if you're just wanting any buffalo grass sod, you can get uh, Sundancer as sod. You can get Cody. Um, those are available in Oklahoma. And you can also buy 609 sod in Oklahoma. We have three producers of buffalo grass sod in Oklahoma, if you refer to the directory that's available. But if you're wanting to get Prestige, one of my favorites, straight female line, you'd have to order it through Todd Valley Farms. Now, if you're ordering buffalo grasses through the mail, they're going to come uh, as plugs in these plug flat trays, usually 72 plugs per tray and hit, they're shipped in heavy duty boxes. They're usually gonna ship them once per week. And there you can see the Stolens of Buffalo Grass. This is uh, the one called Prestige. Here I've laid them out on the, the back tailgate of the truck. This is Legacy, a little darker greener than something like UC Verde. Here's Prestige, my favorite. And then Turfalo, which knows, is no longer available. But you can see there's quite a bit of color differences in them and that plug flat trays are regularly available. Okay, so what's the going cost today? Well, I priced Prestige Buffalo Grass at $50 to $55 per 72 plug, uh, plug flat tray just this morning for the purposes of this presentation. So if we were gonna use that one. Now, Prestige is protected by trademark, the name is, but the actual variety that's sold as Prestige, its patent has expired. So as long as, it, let's say you wanted to go into selling buffalo grass and you wanted one of the best ones there was as sod or plugs you could actually buy prestige buffalo grass rename it as something else and just don't use that word prestige because the trademark is protected but the patent is off and if you ever got questions about what you can and can't do without getting in trouble you give me a call but give me a call first before you do it Okay, we'll be happy to walk you through the process so that you're protected so you don't violate somebody's proprietary rights because we know you have green thumbs and next thing you know you're thinking about a small business and we're all entrepreneurs at heart in addition to gardeners, but uh, let's help get you set up um, the right way to start with on these if you ever want to sell any of these things and we'll, we'll help you understand the I's and the T's of them. Okay, now if you're gonna plant a lawn of these things, you're gonna clean up that lawn completely. We're gonna talk about what's involved with that in just a few minutes, but let's show you what the, the prices are for these. Uh, if you're buying prestige buffalo grass, and if you're following my suggestion that you plant them on 18 inch centers, that means that one plug is expected to grow into an area of 2.25 square foot, then you're buying 34 cents worth of plug for that 2.25 uh, square area okay and so uh, that 72 plug flat tray that's only going to get you under 200 square foot of area but the thing is you have every right if you want to create, create your own home nursery of this stuff and you want to go at this bit by bit in your lawn because you're having to do it on a shoestring budget you're allowed to do that one of the biggest problems is a failure to plan, but if you plan well and you execute and you eradicate the Bermuda grass, you can have a wonderful buffalo grass lawn. But if you rush into it and you do this on the spur of the moment, 
I guarantee you that Bermuda grass is not going to be killed out because you decided to spray it with Roundup today and plant next week. It's not going to happen like that. You're going to be fighting Bermuda forever and eventually you're going to lose your investment. So you have to plan well in advance. You have to plan to eradicate your weed problems and you don't engage with planting until you have eradicated your Bermuda grass weed problem and perhaps some of the other weed problems that are there. But if you've cleaned up that area properly and you plant these uh, plug flat plugs on 18 inch centers and you follow the uh, fertility program and you keep them irrigated, you're going to be able to grow in that area as long as you've accounted for 90 good days of growing season and we get plenty of heat, you furnish it with the fertility and water, you're going to be able to grow that in in 90 days to near 100% cover. Our weed control is much like Bermuda grass, except you're going to be using low end label rates of no matter what product it is that's labeled for Bermuda, you're going to be using the low end label rates. If you hire a commercial lawn service, you're always going to take them by the hand and you're going to say, I've got buffalo grass, not Bermuda in my lawn. Remember, it's tender and you're going to be needing to use your low end label rates. Don't treat this like Bermuda grass. Don't treat it with a Bermuda management program and don't use the high end label rates regardless of what it is. Don't use those high end label rates when you go to control weeds in buffalo grass. If you'll follow those general rules, you'll stay out of trouble and you should be able to have a wonderful buffalo grass lawn. Now, I want to show you some of my experiences here that I've photographed. I actually planted uh, pre-rooted plugs in this area here and this is two months after planting over here. So there's about a, a two month difference in this area here. Good fertility and watering is the difference in the passage of time. So you can grow it in with proper management. Okay. If you're going to use seed, we like to see soil temperatures of 60 Fahrenheit or above, but preferably even soil temperatures in the 70s, 80s or higher. Remember there's one to three pounds of burrs per thousand square foot used. Uh, two would be considered the middle ground. If you've got a particularly green thumb, you can get by with one pound of burrs per thousand, as long as you're willing to put the fertility and the irrigation to it. And even though we say buffalo grass is a low maintenance turf grass, never, never, never run a low fertility or low irrigation program during establishment phase. You want to grow that Buffalo stand in ASAP as quickly as you can. Then you're going to per pull the fertility and the irrigation program out from underneath it once you've got it grown in to 100% cover. Don't try to starve it to death during grow in or you can have nothing but weed problems in there. Okay. You can do the lower fertility and less frequent mowing and much less water after you get it to 100% cover. Your germination is going to be in seven to 21 days under warm soil conditions using treated seed. And again, keep it moist during establishment phase. You should optimize the phosphorus and the potassium. Keep that soil pH um, at 6.0 or higher. I've actually seen buffalo growing in a pH of 11. It loves to grow in crushed limestone where the pH of the soil in crushed limestone is about a pH of 11 or so. To prepare the area, you would have tilled it to about a four inch depth, let the weed seed germinate, spray them out with Roundup, or if you want to use a solarization technique, you can do that. Um, I like to prepare several months in advance. Uh, some people don't like to use Roundup, that's understood, but you're going to have to use the solarization technique with black plastic for probably three to four months in advance in order to get anywhere close to getting decent Bermuda kill. But remember, there's dormant Bermuda rhizomes underneath the soil, and a lot of times those will pop up later on. You got to figure out how you're going to control those. So I oftentimes will start the year before, and I'll start in late summer, and I'll spray that Roundup, and I'll start killing that Bermuda. Then I'll run a green manure crop of something like a wheat or rye over the winter months. Okay. So look for a 90 to 20, 120 day grow in. It is feasible from cedar plugs as long as you keep the fertility to it. Um, now, what happens if you go low maintenance? Well, you're going to spread that on out to five years and you're probably going to have terrible, terrible weed problems. So that's why I encourage you to, uh, to use an intense program. 
um, uh, to get it established. Now what about maintenance phase? Certainly you can run it with no water. It is a native warm season turf grass and if it had decent f fertility and developed a root system it will take our droughts but it will go brown during the drought. If you want to keep it somewhat green half to one inch of water per week during a drought will keep buffalo grass green. Your maintenance fertility I'm going to encourage you to run between one and three pounds of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. You can take your soil tests Run your soil phosphorus at uh, anywhere between 30 and 65 pounds available phosphorus per acre. Based on the OSU uh, soil test recommendations, we say 65 is optimum, but most of your uh, native soils in Payne County and most of the clay part of the state, those are going to run naturally about 30 pounds available phosphorus per acre. If you bump that up, you'll get better establishment, better root health, but certainly buffalo can survive under that, that lower. Um, phosphorus program. Your herbicides, uh, remember your pre-emergent herbicides are always root pruners. Use the low end label rates, but I would suggest using them if you've had a crabgrass problem on the site. You can use your Trimac Weed Be Gone post-emergent materials, but again use the low end label rates. Attack weed problems when they're small. Don't wait till they're big in August. Remember it's too hot in August to do much of anything. So if you've let weed problems go for 90 to 120 days, it's time pretty much to hang up the hat for that uh, particular year. Challenging perennial warm season grasses are always going to be things like Bermuda grass that you see here up on top. Um, this is a rhizome of Bermuda. We, have, we absolutely must clean these things up beforehand in order to have a successful stand. This shows you the very delicate thin stolen of buffalo grass below compared to a thick white rhizome of a common Bermuda or the thick stolen above ground runner of a common Bermuda. And that Bermuda can grow like crazy with fertility and irrigation. So uh, you want to make sure you've eradicated it first. Everywhere that you see an orange arrow is a potential growing point, a place where a new shoot can come out. There's a dormant axillary bud there. Okay. You do have to kill Bermuda beforehand, begin that extermination process preferably 10 to 12 months in advance. Uh, I could not start right now uh, with a uh, Roundup program and think that I'm going to clean it up in 60 days, uh, stand of Bermuda. It's just not going to happen. Now some people have solarized and in 90 to 120 days they've got by, but I'm going to encourage you again to use a green manure crop in the fall of the current year after you've tried to kill out the existing Bermuda stand and use that to stabilize your soil and enrich your soil over the winter and then start your planting of buffalo grass the next year. That allows you to target any uh, dormant rhizomes of Bermuda that, that pop up there. Now this is an example of my lawn where I used a wheat ryegrass mixture. Let's say I started spring of this year, I sprayed out the Bermuda grass and I plugged in Bermuda or excuse me buffalo grass then I planted a wheat crop and here I'm able to scout to watch out for any Bermuda that comes out. And this is actually spring of the second year. There's the dormant buffalo plugs. I stabilized the soil with the cool season grass here. It's an annual. I'm going to mow that out and I know it's going to go out in the heat of the summer and also my buffalo grass is going to come out of dormancy and so this is what that stand looked like. Okay I'm using ryegrass wheat as a green manure crop and there's that same area in the heat and drought of early summer the second year. You see the the buffalo grass plugs uh, in there um, and this is the dying wheat and ryegrass, the stuff that don't look so great there. And then it fills in over time. Now you can use what I call an advancing front technique. That is where you've already established buffalo for instance up in let's say the left hand corner and you've got Bermuda uh, that's maybe on the right side, you just keep spraying a band of Roundup and you move that advancing front, killing out that Bermuda grass so that the buffalo can advance by stolons behind that front. And so that's called the advancing front technique. You can use it over a course of a number of years. All it costs you is your Roundup and your time, your Roundup herbicide and your time. And of course, always read and follow your Roundup uh, label, your pesticide labels, no matter what the product is, use your proper personal protective equipment. It's not going to tell you details on things like though what I call my advancing front technique, but you can use that technique uh, for doing a lawn on the cheap. 
All right, herbicide wise, we've done a lot of work on it. We essentially can tell you that buffalo grass is tolerant to the light herbicide use rates of anything that can be used on Bermuda. But I do stress the light or lower end label rates, not the high end label rates. And you do have to talk to your lawn care folks about that. Now, sometimes people talk mythically about buffalo grass. Let me tell you something, it gets all the same weeds that Bermuda grass and any other lawn, warm season lawn will get in there. This is windmill grass, native warm season perennial bunch type grass. Maybe you like this, I do, but if you don't, you can take it out with tenacity herbicides selectively. We'll take windmill out of buffalo grass. Uh, things like field bindweed, there we're gonna use the dicamba herbicide uh, such as in Trimac or Weed Be Gone, or we might use Quinclorac, such as in the herbicide drive, to selectively remove the bindweed out of the buffalo grass. There's prostrate spurge. Hey, did you know that's a native warm season annual? It's native to the short grass prairie as well, as, as well as most of the continent. Uh, but if you wanted to take it out, we would use very early on in the spring a post-emergent application of something like Trimac or we'd be gone. Now, what happens if you let that go and it's a three foot wide patch in August and we're sitting at a 98 or 103 degrees? Well, it's too late. You got to attack these weed problems when they're small. You attack them in the spring. And also during really hot temperatures, the volatility, which means the ability of herbicides to evaporate off that canopy and move as a vapor, to your sensitive garden plants or your sensitive broadleaf crops, that volatility is enhanced during really hot weather. So don't let your broadleaf weed problems become big problems because you essentially have to pass on controlling them once we get into really hot weather. And we're heading for a week of hot temperatures, right? Things like crabgrass, we use pre-emergent and then you can come in post-emergent with something like quinclorac, which is an active ingredient drive or your uh, post-emergent crabgrass mixed uh, products with 2,4-D, MCPP, dicamba mixed with chlor quinclorac. Um, those are on the market from Bayer Advanced Lawn Weed Control, um, also some of the other major marketers. Armadillos will dig in buffalo grass to find grubs and other things, just like they'll do it in Bermuda grass. Short tail crickets will form mounds in buffalo grass lawns just like they do in Bermuda grass. Special problems include things like mites that you see here, mite damage. We usually live with that. Like turf grass is pretty tough. You can live with most mite damage. Uh, in general, buffalo grass does suffer from the same cadre of problems that affect common Bermuda and hybrid Bermudas. And most of the diseases and insect problems that we've seen on Bermuda grass have easily moved across to buffalo grass. So there's nothing magical about buffalo grass. If you try to manage it intensively, the same critters that feed on Bermuda grass will easily move over to buffalo grass. I encourage you to uh, enjoy native plants in Oklahoma, uh, maximize their use in the landscape from a turf perspective, consider the use of buffalo grass, but don't do it on the spur of the moment. And if you're going to engage with buffalo grass use, I encourage you to make that plan to start the eradication process of Bermuda grass the year before you actually intend to seed, sod, or plug the buffalo grass to make sure that you've gotten rid of what will no doubt be your worst weed problem, and that is Bermuda grass. And with that, I would be happy to open it up for questions. And I'm, I will try to take a look at the uh, chat box, but uh, David, at this point, I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen and try to address the questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Um, we have one on the chat that says, what is the latest you would recommend if irrigating daily? I'm not sure. Does that recommend establishing? We need a little more info on that, Stephanie. Um, do you want, if you, you can, go ahead. 
Dennis? For, seat, for seating, okay. For seating, well, okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, first in general, we're not talking about cool season grasses here, so we're not talking about tremendous disease potential like we are with tall fescue or cool season grasses where we say don't extend the period of canopy wetness. So whatever fits your schedule and also what fits the needs of that seeded buffalo grass stand is going to be fine. Uh, we don't have that special concern about length of canopy wetness so much with buffalo grass as we do with the cool season grasses like tall fescue, bluegrass, uh, perennial ryegrass. So I'd say what that stand actually needs based on your assessment of it. If it's wilting, uh, certainly we to maximize uh, growth and development, we don't ever want a young buffalo stand to wilt. You always want to keep it uh, adequately moist. Um, okay. Another question there was sun requirements, uh, Dennis? Yes, good question. Uh, under no circumstances think of buffalo grass as being adapted in the shade. Think of it as a full sun grass. There is some evidence to suggest it creeps further into a shade line than what Bermuda does, but let's keep it out in full sun. That way we don't experience any disappointments. Uh, it will go into a very, very light shade, but let's not use it in a a medium or a deep shade. Let's keep it out in full sun. I like shredded bark and wood chips and other ground covers and uh, the such for, for shaded areas. I like keeping uh, turf out of the shade. Okay, at this point I'm scrolling through the, the comments there to see that I've addressed them all. Appreciate the uh, kind thoughts of thank you there. My pleasure. Okay, what is the status of an OSU buffalo grass fact sheet? I'd be happy to help as needed. From Moss to everyone. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Moss, I don't know if you were present when I covered the uh, NATURF establishment and management guide. Essentially anything that we would say would be the same as what is in that guide, but uh, yeah, it would be nice to have one, wouldn't it? So uh, we'll be working on that, but uh, the NATURF guide that is posted at the Johnston site is an excellent resource. It was put up in the uh, about 2014-15 time period. I was given as a courtesy the option to review that. I reviewed it and endorse it wholeheartedly as a man establishment and management guide. Any other questions? What is oh, what is the biggest advantage in using buffalo grass over Bermuda? From what uh, great question uh, for those of you that are passionate about native plants? That in itself, that you're not going to be introducing a plant that isn't native to the ecosystems that we have here, is a check in the column. Uh, it is very drought resistant. Modern buff, uh, Bermuda grasses, though, are also extremely drought resistant. Uh, so we can't give that credit to buffalo grass over Bermuda grass. And in fact, most of the Bermudas are going to stay greener longer into a drought than a buffalo grass. The lack of invasiveness into ground beds. If you like to have ornamentals, uh, the buffalo grass only has stolons, So it's a lot easier to control and it's slower spreading than Bermuda grass. And also you don't have to worry about underground invasion by rhizomes. Those are some other ad advantages. And if you decide you want to easily kill out the buffalo grass to put in another uh, ground bed or other ornamentals and things, you can do that with the buffalo grass. It's much easier to, to go ahead and kill out if you say, end of that turf grass, I want to put another bed design in there. Uh, it's easy to get rid of the buffalo grass compared to Bermuda grass. So you can change up your landscape uh, much more quickly as you desire if you've chosen buffalo grass as the main turf grass. Okay, the question, Dr. Martin, will we have success growing buffalo in northeastern Oklahoma, particularly Washington or East Osage counties? I've visited such areas and in your native stands, if you set a mower down into your prairies there and you start mowing, you actually select for the grandmas and also buffalo grass. So provided you're not in shade in those areas, uh, out in natural areas, you have already have a fair amount of buffalo grass in most cases. And yes, in full sun, you can easily establish it uh, in those areas, provided you eradicate the things like Bermuda grass first, 
and keep the buffalo grass out of the shade. There were a couple questions, Dennis, uh, or just confirmation that it's still okay then for the next two or three weeks to seed buffalo. So yes, through June, I guess. Yes, we're still in what I consider the optimum time period for seeding buffalo grass, provided that you have done due diligence in cleaning up your Bermuda grass and other weed problems uh, in that area. I've seeded actually into the third week of August. Not that I'd recommend that you try it, but I've done it successfully and uh, put the fertility and the water and the mowing to it and had it over winter, winter wonderfully. So uh, we can definitely seed through all of July. Uh, you can cheat into August as long as you optimize your management practices. But remember folks, you have to clean up the Bermuda grass first or else you're gonna be sorely disappointed later on. Any other questions for Dennis or me? Hey, the question about the, I noticed the solarization. You know, I haven't personally tried that, Dr. Justin Moss, who's now our department head, has an ongoing study, I think, where he has different organic herbicides. He may actually have a solarization treatment in there, I'm not sure, but I have conveyed with some of the people on the Oklahoma native plant site, there are some people that swear by solarization, but they like to get a good solid 90 to 120 days in with black plastic, and they even say they have some Bermuda escapes. So you have to manage your program such that you have a means of getting those little Bermuda plants out even after you solar solarize. If I was going to engage with solarization, I, st I tell you I would still start that process the year before that I was planning on establishing the buffalo grass just to make sure. And I would run that green manure crop, that wheat, ryegrass, whatever you want to run over the winter to stabilize it, build your soil and give you a shot that, that second year again. Um, at, at, at weed control. Another question, does buffalo grass have a soil type preference? Clay, sand, loam. Good question. It does like your heavier textured soils, but you shouldn't think that if you got sand that that means you can't use it. Uh, but it does perform best on your heavy textured soils, but we have found it in sands. Uh, if you have a sandy site, you might reach for a blue gramma, hairy gramma, side oats gramma. Those are gonna perform a little bit better. Uh, on a sand, but if you'll keep the irrigation and fertility up, you still can have really good performance of, of buffalo on the sands. And Dr. Moss mentioned the, the study that we are doing. It's down at the Perkins Research Station, and we've been um, uh, sharing it on Oklahoma Gardening, so keep, keep posted or tune in to Oklahoma Gardening as we continue to share our results of several different methods that we've been using to to kill out or control I guess Bermuda grass <laughs> and other weeds so <clears throat> David uh, everyone is welcome to this presentation how would you like to see the PDF copy of the presentation handled or I can give away also the the PowerPoint presentation, as long as if someone dissects it, they do give credit to the original photographs. Um, I can share it with the county extension offices. That might be the easiest way to do it. And then just, you can contact your county educator for a copy. Um, this will be, this has been recorded both on Zoom as well as it's uh, on YouTube and I will share those links with you as well. So if you want to go back and listen to or watch it again, um, you will be able to do so. Okay, we're almost at two o'clock. Um, anybody else have anything else? All right. Well, thanks everybody. I greatly appreciate uh, everyone joining us. And again, just a reminder, if you were unable to, or if you didn't put in the chat what county you're representing, please do that before we close out here, if you didn't do that already. And then I hope that you will join us again next week with Jen Olson talking about um, diagnosing diseases in the landscape. 
And I will be sending out another link and sharing that with the county yet county offices, the county yet your county educators, uh, for the the Zoom record, you know, for the Zoom link for the next for next weeks. And I'm trying to figure out a, a good way to make that easily accessible to everybody. Uh, I'm still kind of learning all the ins and outs of of Zoom and and uh, all this fun technology. So, if you have any questions for me, if you have any comments about this program or suggestions for future ones, um, you're welcome to email me at david.hillock at okstate.edu. Um, so uh, if anybody, no, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. And again, thanks everybody and hope to see you or hope you can tune in next week.